uh, first of all, thank you for attending this talk. Um, I expected a lot less attendance. <laughs> um, so this talk is about writing OpenShift and Kubernetes controllers in Python. Uh, and my name is uh, Subin. I am a senior software engineer in the AICOE team. Uh, in the last uh, one, two years, uh, I spent a lot of time writing controllers in uh, different uh, languages. And this talk is about uh, sharing some of my experiences writing in uh, Python. Um, so what we're trying to uh, talk about today, what I'm trying to talk about today is about controllers, uh, which are the brains behind uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift. Uh, just to get an idea about the audience, does uh, anyone use OpenShift here or Kubernetes? Uh, how many of you are from, uh, not from Red Hat and use OpenShift or Kubernetes? Just one, that's good. Um, so, um, the agenda for today to understand more about uh, OpenShift uh, and Kubernetes operators, we need to understand what Kubernetes is and uh, uh, learn a little bit about controllers and CRDs and operators, and then uh, talk about how to design a controllers from scratch. Like, what what are the considerations you need to take care of, and what are the options we have uh, to write a controller? Uh, so we will uh, pick. Uh, two of those options. One is the Go client and the Python client. And then uh, briefly talk about uh, operator SDK and do a couple of demos uh, to showcase the Python controller. So what is uh, Kubernetes? Um, many of you might have interacted with Kubernetes uh, via the UI or the CLI. Uh, you might think that it is something like a master-slave uh, architecture. Uh, there's a master node and there's a couple of slave nodes. Uh, and it does something with uh, containers. Uh, but that basic idea may not be enough to start out writing controllers. Uh, you need to learn a bit more about the components of uh, Kubernetes um, to basically understand uh, which component to interact with when you write uh, controllers. So the co uh, Kubernetes components uh, are shown in the diagram here. Uh, there's a master uh, which contains uh, HCD, uh, which is like a store, uh, which stores uh, different states of objects in a Kubernetes cluster. And uh, you have API server. Uh, which is the main uh, management entity. Uh, and then you have different nodes on which uh, these uh, application pods are deployed by uh, the Kubernetes. Uh, so again, coming back to the question, what is Kubernetes? Um, we started with the basic idea of this master slave, but um, and then we talked about um, deploying containers. Kubernetes is a container orchestration engine uh, which is designed to uh, deploy containerized applications on a set of nodes. And uh, so there's nothing new about uh, anything like a cluster manager which does uh, you know, a deployment of some objects on nodes. There has been, like in the last many decades, countless uh, such uh, cluster uh, managers. Uh, so what's the difference about, different about Kubernetes and uh, the previous cluster managers is that um, many of them previously implemented, they were monolithic in uh, architecture. What that means is that there's a central brain behind uh, these uh, clusters which knows the entire state of uh, all the objects which the cluster manages and when it tries to achieve any action, it tries to base that action on the entire set of uh, um, state uh, of the entire objects in the cluster. Whereas Kubernetes is uh, slightly different where it's a decentralized approach, uh, it has multiple brains and each of these brains are independent uh, of each other. And uh, these brains uh, take care of uh, specific parts of the cluster, uh, and uh, they interact with each other um, 
to basically manage this cluster in an autonomous way. So that autonomous is the basically the big thing in uh, Kubernetes, uh, and we will learn more about how this autonomous behavior is achieved by these uh, different brains of Kubernetes. Another thing about uh, Kubernetes is that it's a declarative uh, orchestration engine. Uh, what you mean by that is the, the objects uh, which are there in the cluster, uh, are, they, start, they, start, they start out the journey with a certain declared uh, st desired state. For example, what you see on the UI, uh, sorry, what you see on the slide is a deployment uh, um, uh, specification which uh, defines that I need a deployment uh, with uh, three replicas uh, of this particular container. And this is defined by a user. And the Kubernetes cluster basically looks at this uh, declarative uh, specification and starts about the journey of uh, realizing this uh, deployment. And uh, what Kubernetes does is that when it tries to uh, take actions on objects which it manages, the most important thing it always does is that it knows that it needs to take an object from point A to point B, that is a state A to state B. It always starts out by looking what's the current state. It's not looking at the previous states of an object. It takes the current state into consideration and then decides based on the current state what's the action it needs to take. And what it wants to do is that based on the current state, it wants to move uh, one step further towards the final user-defined uh, state of this particular object. So uh, this uh, movement from one state to the final state can be a single step or it could be multiple actions. And each action uh, changes the state of the uh, object. And uh, so, uh, so we start out with the current state and uh, the Kubernetes eventually reaches the final state. Uh, and when the final state is reached, there's no longer actions which needs to be taken on the state because the final final state is the desired state uh, of the object given in the specification. Uh, so once the final state is reached, uh, the Kubernetes cluster has kind of reached a steady state for the managing that particular object. And all these state changes for different objects are to be stored, and they are stored in the HCD uh, uh, node. Uh, and these states are uh, stored by the API server, which is the central management entity. Uh, the API server is a management entity which directly talks uh, with HCD and uh, manages the state of uh, different objects. Uh, it also has endpoints which uh, we can use to create a controller. So when we interact with the API server, we need to be uh, uh, careful about what kind of objects uh, we deal with. In Kubernetes, so there's a concept of uh, each object uh, is a type, and that type is called kind. For example, uh, you have pods, uh, images, application controllers, blah, blah, all the others. So all of them form a kind. When you create an instance of any of this kind, uh, it's called a resource. Uh, it's called a resource because uh, just like the HTTP resource, uh, like the rest uh, resource, this uh, instance of the uh, object has a HTTP endpoint where you can uh, do the CRUD operations of creating or updating the object. And another uh, thing uh, the API, uh, each of these resources may or may not have is the sub-resources. Uh, the thing which we need to uh, be careful with sub-resources is that they may not be HTTP uh, endpoints. They could be some other protocols. So, so the first demo I, I have um, is just trying the baby steps of how exactly we can explore or understand uh, controllers and how um, 
we can start out this journey of understanding what if I, if I am right in the middle of Kubernetes cluster as a person, what would I see? So I have here a demo where uh, I'm creating a pod, and this pod has the OC or the kubectl command line. I hope uh, people are familiar with uh, the OC tool. Um, and if so, let me just show you this particular. Um, Great. So I have here a pod. Um, it's I basically have uh, named it as my controller dev environment. It's just a pod, uh, and that pod has this OC tool, and. Um, it's, it's running an infinite loop. I just have a bash infinite loop. But if I go to the terminal, I can actually execute uh, uh, the commands of OC. And uh, I can do stuff like um, you know, OC uh, get pods. Um, so what I'm trying to show you is the first baby step where I am in the Kubernetes cluster. And I'm uh, as a program, I am in a pod. And I'm using uh, something, a basic tool like OC, uh, which we use outside uh, the cluster to manage clusters. And we are using that tool inside a pod to like do the same operations, like uh, get pods and look at the events. And uh, API server um, exposes something called um, events. I'll just come to that later. Uh, we, we can also explore like different options, um, command line options of OC in that pod by looking at different resources available in the API server. So this um, uh, picture, uh, this slide talks about the different kinds uh, which are available. The kinds are the uh, type of the entities which uh, Kubernetes manages. And on the right hand side, you can see the different kinds. So uh, what, what I'm trying to do with the baby step here next is get more understanding about how Kubernetes work. So so far, we have an understanding that it's a decentralized uh, cluster. There are multiple brains. And uh, uh, one important thing these brains do is that they look at the uh, current state. They are not looking at the historical state and all that. And they also look at the desired state. So we understand it's a decentralized and there's a state change of objects, and the current state uh, is important. So with this kind of basic information, we still haven't really understood controllers uh, or how these brains work. So uh, the brains or the controllers are these uh, uh, control loop. Uh, it's basically an application running in a pod in an infinite loop, uh, which does something. Uh, we'll come to what that is uh, later on. So, uh, so it's a process which constantly runs in a pod, and uh, it's doing something thing to uh, manage the resources and entities uh, managed by Kubernetes. So this is just a diagram just to show uh, how a controller basically looks. Uh, uh, you know, just just a uh, some in this infinite loop within a controller pod. But we still haven't come to like, OK, how exactly does it do it? Uh, and so. The controller, uh, what it does in this infinite loop is to constantly read the state of the resources it manages. And as soon as a ch uh, ch change of state is uh, received, what it does is it tries to find out what's the next action it needs to take on that state. And it does the change, so the controller does actions. It listens for events, and it does an action, and then the uh, uh, state is updated, and then it goes back into this infinite loop, waiting for the next event change. So if you want to write a program, uh, programmatically it's like this. The algorithm is you get the uh, first uh, uh, user-defined state, which is the final uh, desired state based on the specification. And you get the current uh, state. And then uh, you invoke, let's say, make changes. Uh, basically, it figures out what's the action it needs to take based on the current state. So uh, this, these state changes uh, in uh, Kubernetes object are called events. Uh, 
so every time uh, let's say a pod starts or stops a uh, event is generated because the state of this pod has changed and um, these events can be uh, captured by this watch interface which is um, exposed by every resource uh, this watch uh, uh, interface is like a change notification feed. Like every time there's a change in the state, uh, you can basically hook on to this feed and get to know what's the change. The most important uh, kind of um, events we are looking at uh, from this watch interface is listed here, uh, added, modified, and deleted. Uh, I will show you a demo soon uh, uh, what that means. So here's a demo. Uh, what this demo is doing is that I have written a simple Python code. Um, and uh, so this is a pod in which uh, this uh, Python controller code is running for a long time in an infinite loop. Uh, and it lists basically the events. Uh, seen uh, by this uh, uh, pod, uh, all these events are specific to pod. So this is a controller pod which just looks at pod. And you can see that it lists all these events which it is captured for the different pods uh, created here. Uh, just to explain, um, let's say let's pick up the second last line. So the second last line says uh, a modified event for this particular pod and it shows as a source uh, version. Uh, the source version is a very important, um, uh, it's like a number which basically identifies the state change. Like if there are n state changes, there would be n different uh, resource versions. And the last line uh, shows uh, a deleted event uh, where the this particular pod, my controller dev pod has been deleted and you can see that, that there's a corresponding resource version change for that particular event. So this example, what it shows is uh, it's a Python, it's a very basic uh, Python um, controller which is uh, having an infinite loop and it's listening to different events uh, specifically for pods and it's trying to uh, capture the output of all those uh, state changes. So uh, coming back to this question of how, how does Kubernetes work, we, we have understood that it's a decentralized, we have uh, multiple brains in it, and all these brains are basically uh, the controllers, and the controllers are infinite uh, loops running in a pod, and uh, these controllers uh, uh, consume events via the watch uh, interface, and the, uh, this interface uh, is between the uh, API server and the controller. Uh, um, and the API server is part of the control plane. So this, for, uh, this slide basically diagrammatically explains how a Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster looks, um, you know, with respect to uh, a controller view. So a Kubernetes cluster has many controllers and each controller does specific things. For example, the demo I showed just now has a Python controller which just looks at pod. So you might have a pod controller, you have a replication controller, you have image controllers. Uh, for every uh, entity type in Kubernetes, there's, there's a separate controller. So, uh, so we have, you know, some basic understanding about how Kubernetes works, and we now understand that uh, controllers are important, and we also understand some basic idea about how controllers and this infinite control loop uh, exist. So now uh, let's dig deeper about um, how exactly we write a fully functioning controller. So we 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 have also looked at. Um, um, how does, if, if I'm a controller code and I'm right in the middle of the Kubernetes cluster, what, what do I have? What are the tools I have and to access the cluster and look, look into the cluster and do stuff in the cluster? But uh, there's a lot, lot more to writing a controller than just uh, looking at the events and uh, using the watch interfaces. Uh, 
assume that your a controller has crashed and it comes up again how does it know what to do next so there are thousands and thousands of uh, resources in a kubernetes cluster and how does it identify like where i am because it has completely lost track of uh, uh, what it was doing previously before the crash so the first thing a controller needs to do after the crash crash or when it actually comes up is that it needs to get the entire state of uh, the object it manages so what it does is get to do a list function which uh, you need to get all the object states and the, and once you get the object's uh, state uh, via the events of each of these uh, resources you need to do some calculation like which is the most recent event of this object and that is done by looking at the resource version uh another thing uh, we we may be tempted to do when we write controllers is that we may use the top level event resource which should not be used uh, it is it is mainly used for uh, logging purpose and uh, it has a kind of a clean up activity where after every one hour all the events in the top level event resource are deleted so if you are writing a controller don't use the top level event just use the individual events available for each resource and we we uh, learned that watch interface is the interface which we use to uh, capture all the events but there's certain problems with watch calls they are actually very expensive and we shouldn't be using too many of the watch calls uh, in a controller especially when you are writing python application uh, we have to be careful because of the concurrency concerns um, our python application might crash if we are using too many watch calls so uh a controller has come up and first thing it did was uh, do a list call where it uh, captured all the events and then it looked at what's the most recent resource version of the pod uh, is and once uh, the list function completes the controller has all the state information until that moment t is equal to zero moment but from that moment onwards it only needs to do a watch call on the most recent resource version meaning uh, if uh, uh, once it identifies the latest pod all it needs to do from that point onwards is to uh, find what's happening to that pod from that state onwards so uh, when you're writing a controller you need to start with the list call but then immediately move to the watch call based on the resource version and uh, controllers uh, are these uh, infinite control loop uh, control loops running infinitely for long periods of time so it it needs to store a lot of uh, event information so it's very recommended that you use a data structure or some cache uh, when you're writing in python so there are certain uh, options available in python uh, one is of course you can use a simple hash map but uh, I would recommend something like a bloom filter because a uh, bloom filter data structure gives you certain benefits one is uh, uh, you can use it to check if uh, is it something like an indexing purpose you can check if uh, have i seen this uh, 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 pod before because when when you capture when you do the list and you capture the, all the state information of the pods they may not come sequentially they may come haphazardly and you need to actually uh, write some logic to figure out which is the most recent uh, event and uh, if you're using a cache uh, there's one problem uh, is that you know python writing stuff in python this, there's always a performance delay it's not one of the it's not like writing in c c++ or even in go so uh, the whole flow of this api is to get the events and store it in a uh, uh, cache uh, there will be certain delays and so there will be always certain lag between the events in the cache and what might be there in the hcd so we need to uh, do something like a resync where resync is something like a relist every uh, 30 minutes or 15 minutes depending on how many events we have
and controllers uh, especially the ones written in python uh, when you do the watch calls they tend to break after certain time so uh, what we need to do is we need to look for uh, those network breakages and immediately restart the watch uh, stream call else uh, your controller would you know constantly be uh, reinitializing all the time and it would never get a chance to do the business logic and uh, one other thing uh, with the python uh, controllers is that when you receive these events uh, from the watch interface you need to do some kind of validation uh, also you need to validate the resources uh, uh, for example if you're creating a controller for a custom resource uh, you need to validate the input fields of this custom resource events because uh, uh, it's we don't have enough tools to uh, do the schema check of the resources so um, if if there is a spelling mistake or there's a incorrect incorrect ascii key in the um, event um, captured uh, it might lead to some net uh, failures so also have proper default values if the uh, if the event uh, state change of that resource does not have values for certain fields so now we come come to um, uh, you know writing controllers so we we learned about you know some of the design considerations we need to take care uh, to keep this um, controller code running for the long time and not failing and always you know uh, doing thing what it is supposed to do uh, so there are some options to write it. One is, of course, the Go client and the Python client. Um, the Go client, uh, you can access the Go client here. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the Go client, um, but the most important thing I want to talk is that Go clients have a few data structures, which um, the Go clients have uh, some data structures which are very useful because uh, one is the informer data structure. Uh, what it has is that it has a cache implementation and it has a watch interface and uh, event handler and lister so that um, when, a, when a controller is using um, the informers, you can basically use uh, this data structure for uh, writing the controller. It can, it, it can do the listing and then it can just get the latest uh, resource version and then watch that resource version. And uh, the Go clients also implement a resync functionality where um, it tries to update um, the cache frequently. And another data structure the Go clients have is uh, work queue. Uh, so there are situations where, for example, um, you create a pod and you delete a pod and then you create a pod. Let's say that's the flow. And in between this creation and deletion, assume that your controller fails. So uh, and when the controller restarts, it's going to capture the whole bunch of events related to creation and deletion. But since the deletion event and uh, the control failure happened kind of uh, simultaneously, the controller never actually deleted the pods, although the delete event has come. So if you have a work queue, what uh, you can do is you can prioritize deleting those pods before uh, scheduling the next creation of those pods. Else what you'll have is in your cluster, you'll have multiple pods which were supposed to be deleted, but they were never deleted. Unfortunately, in uh, in the Python client, we don't have these two data structures. So if you're writing controllers in Python, you would eventually have to implement uh, some of these. Uh, so the next thing uh, I want to talk about uh, briefly is an operator. So far, we looked at a controller. A operator is pretty much uh, a controller which manages a custom resource. So I... Uh, previously talked about uh, resources, you know, like the pod res uh, entity resources and uh, deployment configs and uh, replication controllers, etc. Uh, they are the default uh, object entities of Kubernetes, but you can go ahead and create your own uh, custom resource. Uh, 
for example, uh, here's a custom resource uh, definition of a foo resource. It basically does nothing. Uh, uh, on the left-hand side, I have uh, mentioned how you define uh, user-defined custom resource. And on the right-hand side is uh, instance uh, specification of uh, the foo custom uh, resource. It basically does nothing. The specification, if you look, uh, all it has is just a version number. So you, you can basically write an um, operator which is uh, in Python, which just looks at this uh, foo uh, resources and uh, tries to do something with it. Maybe create a foo resource and then create 10 pods from the uh, specification. I don't know. I mean, yeah. Um, so when it comes to Python, uh, the first option you have is um, the OpenShift REST client, which is based on the Kubernetes Python client. This is uh, used, if you look at the topmost right corner, it is very heavily used in many uh, examples. Uh, it's used by almost 321 projects so far. And uh, um, I have few um, examples, like the example which I showed here is actually using this particular uh, project to capture the events for pods. Um, and what I wanted to show as part of the demo was to show the add modified events for the pod. And uh, this uses the OpenShift REST client. Uh, and the next option is the Python uh, OpenShift client Python. Uh, the difference between this and the previous one is that this is based upon using OC. So if you are uh, happy with using OC in a pod, uh, then this particular client can be helpful. Uh, the one drawback, of course, is that this does not implement a watch call. Uh, but I uh, have seen few examples where they have used both the clients. Uh, they have used OC using uh, this particular uh, project to do few stuff. And it, it uses uh, the other project uh, to do few other stuff in the controller logic. Uh, and I have recently, uh, in the last two, three months, come to, came to know about this particular project. It's, uh, it's a, it stands for Kubernetes uh, Operator Framework um, from Zalando uh, Company. Um, so this particular project implements, uh, it doesn't implement informers, but it implements a certain work queue and event handlers. But it's not, I, I don't know, personally, I don't know if it's very popular. Like, if, I, if you look at the right-hand side corner, it is used by about 14 projects um, compared to the Python client. Uh, I uh, work in the AICOE team, and in the AICOE team, I work in the Thought uh, project. And uh, we have developed quite a few operators and controllers. Uh, so if you go on to this GitHub Thought Station uh, repo, you, you can basically search for a couple of uh, Python operators and controllers uh, which we have written. And if you plan to do uh, something, you can you know kind of use this as a reference. Uh, the last uh, example uh, I want to talk about is uh, operator SDK. When you write um, controllers in Python, this is a lot of work. Uh, one is you write your Python code, and you might have to implement uh, uh, informers or um, uh, work queue or some event handlers. But you also need to package them in a, a Docker file. You need to create this container image, and you need to, let's say, uh, take care of security policies, RBAC. And uh, what Operator SDK does is that it basically uh, does all this work for you pretty much very easily. So all you need to do is just focus on writing the controller code. Uh, but, but the problem is that this is Go client based, and uh, it, it's not based on Python. Um, and what I've heard so far is that um, uh, the operator SDK folks uh, with the Python client, they're working on an informer uh, in the Python client. So eventually, maybe in some time future, who knows, maybe we will have a Python uh, operator SDK. Uh, so I have one more demo where um, I have written a simple uh, um, 
uh, a pod uh, controller uh, which is using the uh, operator operator SDK and this particular example again does the same thing it just tries to capture um, the events uh, for of pods <coughs> of pods uh, all these examples are available uh, on this uh, GitHub repo, and you can, you know, uh, look up and experiment with the examples. Uh, so the first uh, folder contains the controller dev environment where you have the OC running in a pod. Uh, it, it has all the templates. Um, if you want to just you know do a OC create template and do a OC new app, you have that for you to uh, experiment. And uh, the, the the so there's a my go controller which is a simple uh, controller written using operator SDK. And there's a Python controller. Uh, which contains the template and um, it also has uh, example where um, if you want to write a operator with some CRDs there's a sample CRD which you can uh, experiment with and uh, the source has a uh, couple of uh, code for um, uh, writing controllers from CR for CRD or writing controllers for existing uh, entities in Kubernetes. Um, so that's it from my side. Um, uh, in conclusion, I just want to say that uh, to write a very good controller, you need to have a good understanding about Kubernetes and how to interact with uh, the API server. And um, also be a little conscious about Python layer itself, that there are certain concurrency and um, um, uh, scalability issues with that, and uh, so do not. I, I would say don't write you know very uh, extensive hardcore uh, controllers. Uh, if if you have a very reasonable amount of uh, logic, uh, uh, which can be done in Python. Um, I think Python the controllers are a good option, uh, but if you need uh, production grade um, requirements of a controller, you need to write uh, in a GoLang uh, as of today. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for coming here. Uh, I can take some questions. So if I'm writing Go code and I need to go off and do some other work, like the controller has to affect some change somewhere else in the system, I can fire off a Go routine, which is relatively lightweight. Um, in the Python world, you're, you're, you're battling the gill. And am I correct in understanding the controllers are single-threaded, right? It's, it's, a, it's a single control loop that's going to be running continuously? It, re, yeah, I mean, regardless of, because the controller is Yeah, the, uh, contr the controller has a single control loop that's just cycling through continuously, right? Yeah. So if you need to go off and do a significant amount of work in Python, um, is it just a case where you say, okay, as soon as we get to this state, rewrite and go? Or is there a way that you typically handle those so, kind of like long-running uh, I.O. tasks? So, so if you're using uh, Python 2.7, there are limited options. But if you move to Python 3.6, there's this async uh, library you can explore that to do that and also um, python concurrency you know there are, pr there are problems with it uh, so there are certain uh, uh, patterns where you can i think use process multiple process where you have one process which is uh, the um, control loop and you can have other processes which are basically communicating with each other uh, via i don't know uh, locking mechanism or some shared cache or something but it's it's tough. Uh, I, uh, if you go to the thought station, uh, one of the controllers which I wrote has uh, three or four threads uh, working together, and uh, there's a lock mechanism uh, where um, uh, the locking mechanism is used to like basically stop one uh, multi-tax sorry multiplex <laughs> actions. 
uh, we're using the AKS. Uh, in that case, uh, are we still need to write a controller for Kubernetes? Uh, I'm sorry, could you please repeat the question? Uh, Microsoft Azure has a AKS. It's a, like a Azure Kubernetes service. It's already um, like a party uh, including maybe controller inside of it. Do you think we are under like a what kind of a uh, situation we still need to write our own controller? Like, uh, it depends on the business logic. Let's say I, I'm just thinking top of my mind. If I want to write a controller which uh, uh, tries to connect to Azure service and let's say spawn off something, yeah. I can, uh, earlier I could have written some simple service, maybe today I will write it as a controller. Uh, with a CRD, and uh, I can say the I can declare a specification. Uh, I can say uh, in the specification connect to this Azure and spin off so and so thing. So uh, uh, it it all depends upon how autonomous you want the system to be. Uh, if you are designing a system auto, uh, with autonomous uh, thing in mind, and you want to like isolate the business lo logic to a certain uh, like a brain, uh, you would try to do this. And it basically uh, it's helpful because if your other uh, control stuff or other uh, business logic is also written in controllers, uh, this kind of scales pretty well. Um, so that's an advantage. Right, I would say write everything in controllers and operators. Okay. Thank you. Um, no more questions. Uh, thank you so much for attending my talk. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.